afternoon. Welcome everyone. Sorry for the delay. I am delighted to welcome everyone to the 2021 Hoffman Family Business Lecture. My name is Sanjay Sharma, Dean of the Grossman School of Business. The Hoffman Business Lecture, which brings the business leaders to talk about strategic issues and industry trends, is an element of the Grossman School of Business's major focus on experiential learning. Today, we are honored to be joined by a prominent business leader, uh, UBM alum, Steve Phelps, to hear his story about leading his organization, NASCAR, through a new commitment to provide a more welcoming and inclusive, inclusive environment for all fans and for the industry. I'm pleased that Matthew Hoffman from the Hoffman family, whose generosity made these series possible, is able to join us for the lecture. So uh, I, I was, I believe that the president, Arimala, was supposed to introduce Steve Phelps, but uh, I don't think he needs any introduction. Uh, I will let Steve introduce himself and uh, begin the talk. So over to you, Steve. Great. Well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, Dean Sharma, and I appreciate the offer to join you. Um, you know, uh, President Jeremel and I have had the opportunity to, to spend a significant amount of time on the phone uh, or Zoom calls since last summer. Um, some of the things that we have done in the stance of social justice, and I and I will get to that. Um, in a little bit will be the heart of the, the presentation that I'm going to give to you or the, or the discussion that we're going to have. At the end, we'll open it up for, for a Q&A and, &A and um, Dr. Heading Grant will be nice enough to, to be the moderator and to uh, get the questions to me. Um, but what I thought we'd do is we'd start with a little bit of fun uh, and do a quick video assuming technology works and uh, give you some perspective about NASCAR and what our season looked like last year. Uh, I think it would be a good way for us to, you know, kind of break the ice. So we'll try the technology and see if it works. We've done business for 70 years one way. We're completely changing how we're doing that business. Really excited about what this is going to mean for our sport and the growth of our sport that's going to continue. You know what makes NASCAR unique really is our fan base. They support brands and services that are part of our sport. Taylor and Hart Jr. waves the green flag. The 62nd Daytona 500 is underway. Here's the big one. So the second right here. You win. Good job, man. The jackpot. It's up to 100 grand. Oh, he's going to take the victory. It's a photo finish. We are committed to our future, and we're looking forward to seeing what lies ahead for all of us. America seemed to wake up to the far-reaching threat of the coronavirus. Coronavirus. COVID-19, an unprecedented night in sports. Three of the four major sports leagues decided to suspend their seasons. MLB opening day has now been pushed, and then NASCAR postponing all races through May 3rd. Now, a network television first. A NASCAR all-star race from the virtual Homestead Miami Speedway, delivered by iRacing. Here they come off the corner for the final time. They all but come together, and the winner is Hamlin. Wow, what a race, what a finish. Yeah, those fans should be cheering. They saw a heck of a race. That is incredible. My God's exciting. After seven agonizing weeks, NASCAR is back. Well, that noise right there, we've been waiting for. We're racing today. Believe it, finally. Sports are back. NASCAR's back, baby! The moment has arrived. The drivers get to strap in, fire up those engines, and get back to what they do best. And we lovingly do it all for you to bring NASCAR to your home for the first time in 71 days. Side by side, racing back to the line. Come on, yeah, boys! Thank you, guys. 
guys. Awesome job. Fans here in the stands. It's good to see you again. Wow. Didn't see that coming. I did not see that coming. I don't even know what to say, man. Never give up. I want to thank everybody out there that's kept things going while we've been trying to stay home, stay safe. Really, really proud of you. Thank you, everybody. All of NASCAR's drivers have rallied around Bubba Wallace. No one is white, black, brown, or yellow. They are all racers. This is one of the most powerful, memorable races and events I've ever experienced. Our sport must do better. Our country must do better. The time is now to listen. Michael Jordan announced he is starting a new NASCAR Cup Series team. Bubba Wallace will be the driver. We ask our drivers, our competitors, and all our fans to join us in this mission. So I uh, hopefully get a taste of, of our sport. Uh, last year was an extraordinary year. Um, and want to talk about really three themes. One is the merging of two companies. You saw a little bit out in the video about ISC, which was a public company that owned 12 racetracks and combining with NASCAR, which is a private company and we are what's called the sanctioning body. Um, and we're a unique, um, we're different than other sports. Other sports have franchises, we don't. So we have owners who are independent. They commit, they contract with the drivers. There are other racetracks that we don't own. Um, so just trying to give you a little perspective of, on our industry, but I thought when our season started last year that the merger, which had happened three or four months earlier, would have been the single most difficult thing that we would go through. Two very different companies, uh, partly because their pub, one was public and one was private, and partly because um, just the cultures were, were frankly wildly different. Um, and bringing those two companies together, I thought was going to be the most difficult thing that uh, that we'd have to face. Um, but on March 13th for our sport that changed so almost a, a full year ago and it's been uh, a very uh, incredible year for us um, a year that we faced challenges that our sport had never had in the 73 history 73 year history of our sport um, certainly the most difficult but obviously or for me anyway I think the most rewarding uh, by a wide margin um, so the situation with COVID and, and trying to manage through a pandemic, I think that easily the most difficult thing uh, for for myself and for my leadership team was really the, the unknown. So on March 13th, um, we shut our sport down, um, had no idea when we were going to come back uh, to racing again. Um, it was a, a stated goal that we were going to try to get back as quickly as we could. Um, I'm proud to say that we were the ma first major sport back to competing, which we did on May 17th. So 72 days of darkness. Um, the early parts, frankly, of the, of the pandemic were very, very difficult for, uh, for my management team and for myself. Um, and it was really the unknown. Um, so what we started to do, to do immediately was try to develop a blueprint um, or some type of architecture that would allow us to get back to racing. Um, first and foremost was to create an environment that was safe, safe for our competitors. So on uh, that first race back for us, um, we had roughly 950 people in what we called our footprint. So, and those people were essential personnel. And so what we had to try to do is figure out how 950 people would be safe at Darlington, South Carolina, Darlington Raceway on May 17th. Um, and we were able to do that. So we developed the plan that we could then bring to state, local uh, health officials, um, county managers, towns, mayors of towns, and, and most importantly, uh, governors of each state that we would compete in. Um, so we went to Governor McMaster first, who is the governor of South Carolina, and took Governor McMaster through our plans. Um, he agreed that it was going to be safe wanted to make sure it was safe for both our competitors as well as the people that are in his state. Um, one of the reasons why we chose 
chose South Carolina is because the bulk of those that compete in NASCAR, drivers, crews, they're all located in, in the greater Charlotte, North Carolina area. So we weren't ready to get with Governor Cooper and get his yes, which we ultimately got. So we started with Governor McMaster. And so, but making sure that everyone felt comfortable going back, it was a huge unknown. Um, we do have some significant advantages versus stick and ball sports. So if you think about the NBA, they're, they're playing in shorts, right? And they're banging into each other and sweating on each other. And, uh, but our guys are all wearing protective gear. They've got helmets, head socks, fire suits, gloves, um, shoes, uh, and, and most of those that would be competing, the 950 people in there, even our officials, are all wearing that same garb, right? That, those, that same built-in PPE. And that was something that was, um, you know, going back to me, I was as nervous as probably any time last year on May 17th because I was getting calls from other heads of sports saying, hey, we're rooting for you. And, and they actually believed it. I believed it this time because if we could go back safely, uh, other sports could follow, which is exactly what happened. So we were the first major sport to come back uh, without fans. Um, you saw some of the imagery around that in the, in the video. And then we were the first major sport to, to come back with fans, which we did um, in Miami first with a very limited number and then started to grow with the same protocols in place, which were which was very important for us to make sure that we had because obviously we need to keep our our competitors safe, but we also have a responsibility to keep our fans safe. Even frankly, if the fans don't want to be kept safe, it's important for us to do that. Um, and so we were able to then slowly build the number of fans uh, who were coming. So by the time we got to August, um, we were able to meet the CDC guidelines of, you know, of social distancing and at our facilities anywhere from 20 to 30 percent, assuming that the governor and, and local health officials said it was OK to do that. And frankly, there are a lot of states that we we couldn't get approval, right? So. Governor Whitmer in, in Michigan, she wanted to keep her flock safe and the best way she thought to do that was to allow us to race, but not to race with fans. And we respected that. Um, that was important for us. So, um, so as you think about unfolding at what, what unfolded in front of us, to have fans back in our stands is great. Um, and you see a lot of other sports, take the, the NHL or the NBA in particular, where they're piping in crowd noise. So they didn't have crowds there. Ours is a little different than theirs because it's difficult watching, in, in my opinion, a basketball game without fans. You just don't have that energy level. And it reflected in the ratings. So as we look at the success that we had from a, you know, bringing fans back um, and just racing overall, it was unprecedented the number of sports who were competing in the months of September and October. No time in the history of this country did you have every major sport competing in in a September October frame uh, time frame. So eight weeks of every sport, um, and I'm proud to say there was only one major sport whose ratings were up during that time, and and that was NASCAR. Um, some were down. The next leading the pack was the NFL. They were down 12. Um, others were down 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. Um, and so we were able to capture a nation last year and and it worked. Um, so that's that's bringing back in a COVID world. And, you know, you, you think about the things that are most important from a leadership perspective at that time. I was fortunate to have incredible people on my management team who were able to help me through this in all kinds of different functional areas. Um, one of the most significant things, I think, as you look back at our sport and 2020 specifically, is what happened in the in the social justice era, um, or in that, particularly for us in that in that June time frame. Um, I think people's perspective of NASCAR, they think of our fan base in a certain way, right? There's a stereotype that exists uh, within our sport. Um, we had done a lot of things in the diversity, equity, inclusion space, frankly, over the last 10 years. But it, frankly, it didn't really um, 
it didn't matter as much to some folks because they're going to see NASCAR in a certain way. So the, the voice you heard, uh, which sounded like a, um, a very muffled uh, sound was at, that was at Atlanta Motor Speedway uh, in the first week in, in June. Um, and I was on the PA addressing uh, both the national audience, but, but importantly addressing our competitors, our crews, um, our own officials about frankly us doing better as a sport and us doing better uh, as a country. I think that took a lot of people off guard um, and it's like, I'm not sure NASCAR has permission to do this. Um, and so the next kind of domino to fall for us really was the banning of the Confederate flag. And I think there are a lot of people who would talk about or do talk about it, particularly at that time. Well, what took them so long to ban the Confederate flag? And then secondly, and probably more, more importantly is, you know, NASCAR having the courage to be able to ban the flag because if people's perception is, is that NASCAR fans are all a bunch of, you know, Confederate flag toting uh, race fans, uh, which they're not, um, then then it would suggest there would be significant courage. So I'll, I'll tell a story and actually it was in this room that I'm sitting right now and I had my senior management team around this table and I asked them, I said, I, I think it's time to ban the Confederate flag. Um, and I said, I think it's time to ban the Confederate flag um, first and foremost, because I think it's a very smart business decision for, for our sport and for our business. And two, it had the added benefit, benefit for me of, of being, I think, a, a moral choice that I think was, was important for, uh, for people who work here. Um, one of the loudest voices, I know there's a, a lot written in the press about Bubba Wallace and you saw the, the tapestry that unfolded at, at Talladega and the colors uh, and that whole industry coming together to support Bubba. One of the things that I read um, and heard is that, hey, Bubba is the one that resp was responsible for the banning of the Confederate flag. He was not. Did he put pressure on us? He did. I had a lot of conversations with Bubba about um, his stance on the Confederate flag and the banning of the Confederate flag. And what I said to Bubba is on a number of occasions is when the time is right, we're going to do it. Now the time accelerated pretty quickly. One of the loudest, loudest voices, frankly, was the people who work here. So we set up a diversity council uh, of roughly 40 employees um, and I got to hear their stories um, about working here. And people who work at NASCAR love working at NASCAR. We are a large community, a large family. And I heard stories about them defending, um, you know, particularly those people of color who work at NASCAR, defending why they work here to friends and families. And they were heartbreaking stories to listen to. Um, and so really it was, that to me was the final push. And so I came to my senior team, I said, well, I think, I think it's now, um, I think the time is now. And I asked them, each of them, I said, we're not gonna have group think here. You're not gonna tell me what I want to hear. I want to hear what you have to say to the banning of the Confederate flag. And I'm gonna look you in the eye, I'm gonna ask you a question. Do you think we should do this? And to a person, they said, yes. Um, there wasn't a lot of de debate about it. It was, yep, this is, the, this is what we need to do and we need to do it now. So I had that meeting, we finished that meeting around noon um, and I went to uh, my two owners and asked them whether they thought it was a good idea. And they said, well, if you and your management team think that's the way to go. Um, and my owners are Jim France and Lisa France Kennedy, um, who are family members whose father and great grandfather started this sport um, and they were going to back the management team that this was a smart decision. Um, so I called up the other uh, tracks, the ones that we don't know. And one of them's uh, called Speedway Motorsports Inc. They're out of Charlotte. They own eight tracks where we race at our top level, our national series. Um, and the gentleman also um, a second generation owner, um, his name is Marcus Smith. And I said, Marcus, we're, we're considering banning the Confederate flag, but we can't do it without your racetracks being part of it. So 
If you can fly a Confederate flag at one of your racetracks and you can't at our racetracks, then that, that defeats the purpose. We needed to be united as an industry that we were going to do that. Um, and it was interesting, you know, he was, um, he was totally on board. Um, and then he asked, well, when, when are we gonna do this? So I called him about 2.30. I said, we're gonna do it at five o'clock today. And he said, you're giving me all of two and a half hours to decide whether this is a good idea. And I said, well, we have to move swiftly um, because the moment is now. And so we, uh, we banned that Confederate flag um, at, all, at all of our facilities. Uh, we have enforced that tightly, um, as has have the other tracks, the SMI tracks, and what we call our independent tracks, Dover, um, Pocono, and Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Um, because if you don't do it united, it, it doesn't work. So fast forward another week. So we're bringing a larger number of fans to the stands. Um, we had just banned the Confederate flag that week. And, you know, in NASCAR, we don't run in the rain typically. Um, and so it started to rain. So we weren't able to run the Talladega event. So we had to pull the plug around four o'clock because it, it appeared like we were going to be a, a rain out. So that wasn't bad enough, right? We've got um, some some person flying over the, the facility with a, you know, a sign that said, you know, ban NASCAR or defund NASCAR and then a Confederate flag next to it. Um, you had folks out on, you know, Speedway Boulevard, which is public property um, with trucks with Confederate flags going by a group of, you know, probably 15 trucks going by, which is their property. There's there's nothing we can do about that or the airspace. Um, and then I was informed by uh, the head of competition, Steve O'Donnell, that we had an incident at one of our garage stalls. And so in one of our garage stalls, there was a noose that was found in the only garage stall that um, where the car was parked of, of Bubba Wallace, uh, our only African-American driver in our top series. So that was, uh, that was heart stopping um, both. Um, so we immediately got a small group together and um, determined what we were going to do. So it was determined quickly that we were going to get the, the FBI involved, which we did. Um, and so that next morning we had 14 field agents um, at our facility um, investigating the news that was in Bubba Wallace's stall. Um, and then came out you know, later that evening with a statement about, about the incident. Um, it was important that the, the noose was found by an African-American crew member um, of Bubba Wallace who reported it to his crew chief, who reported to our head of competition, and, and off we went. And that was a very uh, difficult time. Um, had a press conference the next morning with the media, um, trying to give them an understanding of what was going on. We were as transparent about all of this as we could be. Um, and then the events that you saw in the video with all those people, you know, what, essentially what happened is they decided to push Bubba Wallace's car to the front of the grid. And so you had, you know, 900 people pushing that car, you know, as one family, as one community towards the front of the grid. And it was, it was the most emotional scene that I've ever seen in a non-competitive, um, situation in a sporting event because this was they weren't competing on the racetrack they were coming together as a community and they came to, together as a community to support one of their family members that we all believed was under attack um, the situation um, unfolded where we had video testimony and other that suggested that um, or came to light that that news had been in that garage stall since we had raised the previous September. Um, so it's led to something that I think was important. You know, we talked about this, this community and this collaboration that was so important for us as a sport. Um, and that's what we had to do. We had to come together as a sport. We did it in social justice. We've done it since then in diversity, equity, inclusion and putting together a specific plan, which I'll talk about in a second. But it's more it's broader than that. The, an industry coming together um, that brought this sport back. Um, and I would suggest an industry that came together 
to you think about where NASCAR is pre-pandemic, right? And we were a sport that was coming back. Our attendance was up. Our uh, our our ratings were up in 2019, and we were doing a better job of mining, um, you know, the primarily white older fan base that we had. So what we were able to do in June around the events here was really at the, open up the aperture to a brand new fan base that was coming. Um, and that part is the most exciting part for me. And so the banning of the Confederate flag, the support of Bubba Wallace, um, what we had done from a, you know, at Atlanta saying we needed as an industry to do a better job of listening, learning, educating, you know, walking a mile in someone else's shoes. We needed to do better. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. And so the results, both from a rating standpoint, those that follow NASCAR is like, it's a rainbow that's open for us and it's, it's beautiful. Um, and we're having success. We have two new brand new owners that have come on board. One of them is Michael Jordan, which you saw in the, in the video. Uh, the other is Pitbull. Um, it, it's fantastic that Michael Jordan's driver is Bubba Wallace uh, and Pitbull's driver is Danny Suarez, who is our own, uh, our only Mexican born driver racing in our top series. But what we're seeing is fan bases across, you know, across the, you know, celebrity ranks are all saying that, you know what, I didn't think NASCAR was for me, but I was wrong. I know NASCAR is for me. And that's what the events of June allowed us to do. Now, the key thing for us was not to just talk about it, right? So we had a two and a half weeks that were extraordinary for our sport. And I would suggest the two most important two and a half weeks that this sport uh, has ever had, um, other than its founding in, 19, in 1948, um, what really was that brief time when we shone so brightly, when a nation was watching, will change the face of NASCAR literally and figuratively forever. Um, and that part I'm incredibly proud of. That part, uh, you know, my management team and the support they they gave to us and to lead an industry to a place outside of, you know, in a, a world of darkness to a, a world of light, frankly. And that part is, is very heartwarming. And so I would suggest that Michael Jordan doesn't become an owner. I would suggest that um, that Pitbull doesn't become an owner. I would suggest that Alvin Kamara from the Saints and Renee Montgomery and all these different celebrities and athletes who now have a home at NASCAR, they don't come without the events of last June. So for us, the important thing is to, what, do you, what have you done since then? And so we have three pillars that we have uh, developed in the DE and I space. So for us, they are, are what are we gonna do at home? Right? What do we need to do in this building and, or the 20 different facilities that call home for, for NASCAR employees? What do we need to do with the broader industry? That's the second pillar. And the third one, what are we going to do from an industry perspective? So one of them, the, we'll start with three. And so we're going to come out uh, shortly with the number of organizations that we're going to partner with that support um, various people of uh, of color, so African Americans, um, Latinx, what we do in the LBGTQ community, all these different pieces of organizations that kind of are the building blocks to what what, what those look like. I've also been incredibly um, encouraged by the amount of corporate support. So Comcast, NBC, which is a division of, uh, of Comcast, Fox, um, Coca-Cola, Geico, all these corporate uh, entities coming together and saying, hey, NASCAR, we really want to partner with you in your diversity, equity, inclusion areas. Now, as I said, we've done some really good things um, trying to get you know, our driver um, and crew chief diversity to look different. What we've done from an employee standpoint, it's all changed, right? So we could get corporations to do things with us if we brought, you know, our, our white males to the party, now they want to partner with us on diversity, equity, inclusion. Not because we have a number of white fans, but because we are leading the space in sports in this space. And I think that's what I think is so 
remarkable and shocking to people is, hey, if NASCAR can do it, can everyone? Um, and I'm not sure that's a fair statement, but we'll take it in that sentiment and we'll move forward with it. So going to the middle space, I talked about, um, you know, there was a noose found in a garage and that had been there since September. So I thought it was important to make sure that we have sensitivity training for everyone. So I committed to the media and the industry that we would train every single person that was going to be involved in the Daytona 500, that they would have sensitivity training, that they would have unconscious bias training. How many people walked by a noose? Well, if, it was, if it was one, it was one too many. So we thought that was important. Um, there are other industry programs that we're putting in place um, that will be announced shortly. Um, and then the first piece is, all right, you have to get your own house in order. And that is diversifying our work, diversifying our workplace. Um, every single employee at NASCAR did the sensitivity training and the unconscious bias training. We need to make sure that we are living the values that we want to live as, a, as an organization and as a sport, and, and that's what we've done. So fast forward to 2021 and the start of the season, we just ran our, uh, our fourth race of the season two days ago um, or over the weekend at Vegas, um, and the results are exciting. Um, you know, we had a significant number of fans in the stands. We were sold out the Daytona 500. We were sold out in Miami. We were sold out in Vegas uh, for all three of our national series races. Uh, we next race uh, at Phoenix, it's sold out. We then raced in Atlanta, it's sold out. We then raced uh, Bristol, um, an event that we're gonna do on dirt for the first time in 50 years, and it is sold out. So. We are excited about what's happening, right? The, our share yesterday from a television standpoint, we were plus three. Um, it's hard to be up these days, right? There are, most sports are down and they're down big. Um, the NBA All-Star game was down 23%. And I don't celebrate that. It's just, it's hard. Um, and to try to capture the attention, you know, of this country. So we've been able to do that. Um, it's exciting time to be leading this sport. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm proud um, I'm proud to do that, um, but I'm proud of my my UVM roots. And I was born um, three blocks from Redstone Campus. Just go down the hill, and between Union Street and South Willard Street is a small street called Bayview. Um, I was um, I lived my entire life there until I was 22 years old. And before I went to Boston, um, you know, Burlington is home. Um, UVM is home and um, so I still have three sisters and a brother who live uh, in Vermont and so uh, it, it, it'll always be part of, of who I am um, so I never I'm never far from my Vermont roots I'm never far from my catamount roots so and I'm thrilled to be able to to be able to be here and um, tell kind of our story as NASCAR um, and so with that, I will open it up to any questions that that folks have, and I'll do my best to answer to, to answer each and every one of them. Great, thank you so much, uh, Steve. This was uh, this is an inspiring story. So I'm going to turn it over to our vice president for diversity, equity and inclusion, Wanda Herrick Grant. Uh, to ask us, the questions have been pouring in and she's been looking at them and so she will uh, moderate these questions. So Wanda, over to you to ask the questions. Yes, thank you, Sanjay. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, what an address and a lot of meat there. And um, I'm very, very excited in terms of you being here. And um, I know I'm supposed to just dive into questions, but I cannot just dive into questions without at least first saying that one of the things that we have in common, I, 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 um, I tease um, Dean Sh uh, Sharma about this in terms of you graduating in 1985 and I graduated in 1987 and I came into the university as a business major. So somewhere I wonder if we ever cross path. And so I like to say maybe something about me rubbed off on you or vice versa. And I'm gonna stick to that story and I'm so excited that you are here. So thank you so much. Well, um, lots of wonderful questions um, that are here. And so I will start with, um, uh, one that says, I'm curious about NASCAR's 
decision to enter into a sports sports betting partnership? Was there much deliberation among the board, given some of the stigma associated with gambling? And, and, and so, and do you envision most major sports heading in, heading in this direction? Yeah, so let me, um, I'll start, um, Wanda, with your piece. So I wasn't smart enough to get into business school, so I was an economics major, but so I'm not sure our paths crossed or not, but um, to, to answer your question on sports betting, yes, we see sports betting really in two ways. Um, I would say first and foremost, um, the decision to get into sports betting was one that was a, a little bit of the decision, this is actually probably gonna sound horrible, but it was a moment in time, right? I talked about the Confederate flag band being a moment in time. We decided to open open up to sports betting about you know 18 months ago and really created some relationships. So first and foremost, we needed to create integrity around that. So we partnered with a, a company called Sports Radar. And what you want to make sure you're doing is that um, there are not anomalies that exist that would suggest that someone has cheated, right? Um, so if you see a half a million dollar bet that some car is going to finish 39th um, and, and someone <laughs> wins, you know, and it's 40 to one odds and someone wins an exorbitant amount of money, that would be an anomaly. And so they scour world, worldwide uh, what the betting platform looks, looks like. The next component of betting was really um, looking at creating a partnership that would allow us to find a partner that could then talk to all these betting houses around the world. Uh, and so we did that as well with a company called Genius Sports. Um, and then our part is to give them the feed, right? So where the results are, so people can bet in real time. One of the issues with betting on NASCAR is people aren't very familiar with it, right? So you can bet on the winner. What we want them to do is we want them to bet in real time, right? So, you know, when if, if a caution comes out and someone spins or hits the wall, that the, the odds of that particular driver are going to go down significantly. So I remember a situation a couple of years ago, Kyle Busch, he crashed on lap two. Um, there are a lot of fans that clapped and were happy about it who were there at Bristol Motor Speedway that that happened. Um, and so if you'd done the odds then, his numbers would have gone from eight to one or wherever he was to 300 to one or whatever the number was. Well, he ended up winning that race. So the betting houses would have lost a lot of money. So to me, betting first and foremost is about fan engagement. We want fans, particularly you know younger people who, who are tend to be betting more than older people, at least on NASCAR, that they they are engaging in the sport. Because if they're engaging in the sport and they have skin in the game, they're going to watch. Um, they're going to participate online. They're going to use social media. Um, and that to us was really important. What we're now seeing is there are significant financial returns that are now happening as well. So recent legislation in Virginia that was passed that frankly you know, will be a significant windfall to NASCAR pending legislation in Arizona. And so we're partnering with different betting houses specifically to be able to bet in those uh, in those states. So to us, there's a revenue component and there is a uh, an engagement component to this as well. Mm -hmm. Are other sports doing this as well? The answer is yes, some more than others. But I think the doors have flown wide open. You know, states need revenue um, because of the pandemic and this is a way for states to make some of that money back. Um, some would say on the backs of the consumers or on their, you know, those that live that live in their states. Um, but I think, you know, for us, again, is it about money? It's not. It's really about engagement and, and trying to grow our fan base. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is, what is the role of the founding family in NASCAR today? How did they feel about the Bubba Wallace event? events that unfolded last in the last few months yeah so um so our our the france family started nascar so um bill france senior they called him big bill started in 1948 and then he turned the reins over to his son bill jr who ran the sport uh, until the early 2000s turned it over to his son brian france 
um, who ran the sport until uh, about three years ago um, when the chairman and CEO responsibilities went to his uncle, Jim France. So trying to keep track of this. So the sanctioning body where I worked as the president when we merged with ISC, the public company that owned the 12 racetracks, the CEO of the public company was Lisa France Kennedy. So when we merged these, you know, Lisa and Jim are the two owners. So Jim, the chairman, Lisa, um, the executive vice chairwoman of NASCAR, they're still very, very involved uh, in NASCAR, uh, not just as the owners, but they're involved on a day-to-day -day standpoint. So they're nice enough to let me run it, um, but I have significant input from them. So with respect to the situation of banning the Confederate flag, the support of Bubba Wallace, um, they were firmly behind the decisions that were made by the management team. Um, and they're incredibly supportive of Bubba. I think if you look at, and I was remiss in not talking about this, you know, Bubba Wallace was someone who showed a great deal of courage and grace under fire, right? So he, there were some pretty hateful things that were said um, to him online and other places. Um, I got a lot of, uh, I got a lot of fan mail, a lot of, a lot of was incredibly positive. There's, and there's some really not very nice people out there who were nice enough to share their opinions with me. But Bubba has the full support of everyone here, but he never, he always stayed up here, right? He took the high road all the time. He never went into the mud, even when he was being attacked. He was being attacked by the president of the United States at the time. And I, I know that was hard for him, right? Because the your immediate thing was to come out and say, hey, we're going to go support, you know, th this isn't true. Someone's spreading lies or falsehoods about me and the situation that they don't have the information, right? Which is exactly what happened. And, you know, I think that, you know, Jim was very, Jim France was very much, hey, we need to set the record straight here. Um, and then from a, for those communications majors out there, you know, picking a fight with the president of the United States is probably a bad idea. So we, we stayed up here too, and our, it's, we're going to support Bubba. And that's what our statement was about. Hey, you know, all the things that Bubba said, we are supporting where his position is. And we as a sport um, also talked about being welcoming and inclusive. inclusive. That's the message, right? We want as many people to be part of this great sport as possible. And so having a welcoming and inclusive message, we will always fall back to because that's who we are. If you go to a NASCAR event, not sure how many of you have been, when you come in and you're new and you see a bunch of people, thousands of people camping in the infield at, at our racetracks, some outside, some inside, depending on the track configuration. It's all about, hey, have a beer, grab a hot dog, who's your favorite driver, whatever that might be. That's what Na that's who NASCAR fans are. They're not, you know, people who want to exclude people. They want they want to share their sport. They want to share their love of the sport, and they want to make sure that we are, uh, you know, that everyone is feeling like they're part of where things are for us. Thank you, Steve. I thought I started thinking about two things came to mind was uh, uh, th that quote um, for me, you know, when Michelle Obama talks about you know, when they go high, you know, you, we go high when they go low. And then that came to mind. And then the other thing that came to mind is when I was watching TV maybe a couple of weeks ago or so, and it was um, they were highlighting the Daytona 500 and um, and the slogan, gotta wanna. And um, and I love that slogan. And so when you were talking about the family and the question in regards to where, you know, in terms of the family is at, it made me think about, you know, that idea. You got to want to do it. There has to be that empathy and so forth. So thank you for sharing um, that answer. Um, here's another question for you. Can you tell me specifically what made the time wrong two, three years ago? What changed? And I believe this is in relationship to the um, banning of the flag. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And it's a fair question. I think um, it's a, a little bit like this stance on social justice. I think that after the death of uh, George Floyd, this country was ready for change. Um, our industry 
was ready for change, right? It, it needed people to lead from the front in order to do that. Um, and I think that's what my management team did uh, is to lead from the front. Um, we have a lot of constituents in this sport, including other tracks and that we don't own. And I think that, you know, two, three years ago, this industry wasn't ready, uh, not because it's full of racists, be because there was fear that you are going to kind of shun your your most valuable customers, right? And that, again, you've got a whole group of people, even if they're not Confederate flag waving people, that, hey, I can do what I want. It's, you know, it's a free country and freedom of speech and on and on and on. Well, you don't have freedom of speech across the street at our facility here in Daytona. It's our private property. And so we are going to tell you what to bring and what not to bring. We're going to tell you that you need to wear a mask. And if you don't wear a mask, we will ask you to leave the premises. If you if you put up a Confederate flag in our infield, we will ask you to put it down. We'll take it down nicely one time. After that, if you refuse to take it down, then the local officials, the sheriff will, will escape, escort you from our property. Um, so for us, it's, um, I think the industry was ready and rallied around it. And I think one of the big questions for us and something you as business majors, for those that you are our business majors to think about is the decision, people's perception about, about a fan base and were your season ticket holders and those that watch, would they say, no more NASCAR, you, you're not the NASCAR I knew. We were prepared for that, right? And be willing to do that to a certain percentage of our of our fan base. I didn't think that percentage was gonna be all that great and, and it's proven not to be. And so in opening the aperture to an entirely new fan base is what the real opportunity is for the marketers out there, right? So, oh my goodness. So I remember the time the woman who headed up our um, who was our CMO and head of content, Jill Gregory, and I said, this is this is a gift to you, right? Because you are the one that's going to be marketing to an entirely new fan base, as opposed to the, the tight knit group that represented a particular, uh, you know, a particular um, fan base. Thank you. You're so right. I mean, I'm all in. I am so ready. A new fan. I'm all in. So you're absolutely right. And I listening to you, I what came up for me was just the fear that keeps people from moving. Um, the fear. So this is a, a great question um, here. I appreciate the effort you have made at NASCAR. Well done holding yourself and staff accountable for the values you espouse. To what do you attribute your learning about race and racism? Uh, well, that's a good question. I, it was interesting. We had a town hall right after the banning of the Confederate flag uh, with all of our employees. And we took a group of diverse employees. Um, there were four of them um, who were courageous, courageous enough to come on um, with myself and the fourth generation France family member, uh, Ben Kennedy, who is Lisa's son. Um, and Ben is going to be the future leader of this company. And he was there with the decisions that were made around social justice and banning the Confederate flag. And he was a hand raiser, you know, early on that I'm in, uh, which is fantastic. So the future is bright. Um, so I think listening and then the moderator was a woman. Her name is Diane Billings Burford who is the executive director of an organization called RISE. And RISE is you know, um, really in sports and entertainment and media, a group of comprised of all sports leaders. Um, I, I'm on the board, the board of the chairman of NBC, the chairman of, of NBC Sports, um, Sean McManus from CBS Sports, um, the head of Fox Sports, um, Turner, it's every, everyone is part of this community to try to really shed light on, on racism in this country. And Diane's organization, she does a phenomenal job. I asked Diane to moderate it. And it was interesting because our employees, uh, there are some of our employees who just didn't understand, well, why, right? So I had one of the assistants who works here in Daytona say, boy, because she was feeling a lot of these letters about, you know, unhappy fans. Um, 
And so after that, and she said, gee, I hope we've made the right decision. I said, Lisa, we've made the right decision. Um, I promise you. And so then she heard this moderated group and they were talking about their experiences working at NASCAR. And hey, I had a, an issue repeatedly where someone would ask, you know, for a security person asked for my hard card repeatedly, right? Um, because I was a black man. Um, it, it was just there. And then she sent me an email, first person after the town hall, she said, I get it. And I'm so proud of the decision that we've made. So with respect to me, um, you know, I grew up in Burlington. You know, um, there were not a lot of people in color in Burlington at the time. I, I didn't really know racism. It didn't exist for me um, as a young person, um, partly because of the values of my mother in particular. It's how, it's how we were raised. Um, and that just kind of has translated my whole my whole life. You know, I've got a I've got a senior team here that probably tends to lean um, more left than they tend to lean um, to the right. Whether that had something to do with it or not, I think it really was around um, what I think was doing what was right for our sport from a business standpoint, and then what was right from a moral standpoint. Thank you. I think this maybe takes the. Um um getting more into sort of maybe that idea around education and people being informed and so forth so here's beyond your initial messaging what have you done to educate your fans on the reasoning for the banning of the confederate flag what have you done to bring frustrated folks along with you because sometimes we know people can't see or don't know what they you know can't see in front of them so i think for me i'll go back to this idea of welcoming inclusive not because it's a convenient landing place, frankly, from a communication standpoint, it is. Um, but for for us, I think our fans understand who they are. Our fans understand trying to bring their sport to someone else and educate someone on how great this sport is. So I don't think it's an education of the broader fan base. I, I think you know the broader fan base knows who they are and what their values are and the fact that they they want to be welcoming and inclusive to new people to the sport it's really just educating new people who are coming to the sport and i've been able to do that with a lot of new people you know probably more sports figures and celebrities than others just because they are are reaching out to me to have those discussions so i was with alvin camara in miami last june and we banned the Confederate flag and he reached out and said, hey, I would like to come to the race in Miami. Can I come? I'm like, um, sure, <laughs> you can come. Um, and Alvin Kamara is now a super fan. Alvin Kamara's um, company that he owns, which is a, a Jews company in, in Louisiana, a series of them, um, franchises. He sponsored a car a couple of weeks back here in Daytona. I mean, it's just, it's just all of it just is really um, unusual. I think one of the things I'm most surprised about, you know, it, it's not just um, diverse fans who, who are now coming to the sports, it, it's young fans, right? Because young people are so much of a different way of thinking about the world, um, in many, many cases, incredibly refreshing because of, of they will not participate with something that where they smell racism where they smell something that or feel something that doesn't feel right, they're not going to participate. So again, I would have lost a significant bet, but there was a, a, a survey that came out um, in mid January, maybe late January, and it talked about the fastest growing sports among, uh, sorry, fastest growing brands, not sports, fastest growing brands among Gen Z. And in the top 10, there was NASCAR, which is, I would have lost a lot of money on that one. You know, we, we aspire to be younger and more diverse, and we were on that journey, mm -hmm. but the journey has just been accelerated to a different piece. So again, as it relates to the fans, our promise to the fans is to make sure that they have great racing. Our promise to the fans is that we're going to have schedule differentiation. Our promise to the fans is that we are going to be a welcoming, inclusive environment. Um, and that's what we've done. 
Um, thank you, Steve. I, I just want to quickly circle back to one part that I want to ask you, and, and, and forgive me if you did speak to this already. One of the things that I'm greatly involved in is professional development and education. And sometimes when you want to eradicate or dismantle or change something, you know, you got to be able to articulate or explain to people what it is or, or so that they can, um, they have to know what it is in order to, to sort of um, tackle it. And um, are there any actual um, professional development programs that, that is happening within the organization to make sure as people are onboarding or folks are there, that they're getting that kind of information to understand what they are what they may be um, up against or yeah, how so, or, or build their, you know, fill their toolkits? So the answer is yes. So part of it is I talked about training and, and training our entire workforce, mm -hmm. um, but we are, um, we are in the process shortly to find a new um, head of um, of our HR function, our chief human resource officer, um, and that professional development is something. And I think, frankly, we don't do as well as we should. Um, and the onboarding of uh, of where we are. So, you, if in the video there there were six words that came up, um, starting with authentic, um, inspiring courageous, stewarding, um, innovative, and a missing one. Those are those are our values, right? And those are the attributes of who we are as a company or who we aspire to be. Um, we also have a mission statement that talks about um, making sure that we are, um, you know, not just putting on an incredible racing product globally, is that we are a globally diverse set of fans um, that we are aspire to have as part of our racing. So that was early. We developed the mission statement around the merger to reflect kind of the sanctioning bodies slash NASCAR's original mission statement and, and those of International Speedway Corporation and they're on the 12 tracks. So coming together as one organization has, has been it's it's been hard frankly and then you throw on a pandemic, you throw on social justice, you throw on um, just unforeseen things, um, but professional development is something we're very keen to do. Wonderful. Well, we're getting close to the end here, and um, I, I have another question for you, but before I ask that question, I want to make sure, can't read everything that people have here, but I, the, you know, there's a couple, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, people are saying great to see you. Thank you for your leadership. Um, they're so happy and proud and, you know, that you are a part of our UVM family and um, thank you for all that you're doing and so forth. So I just wanted to make sure that I let you know that some of those those um, those accolades or those comments are coming in. Here's as we, um, you know, we'll see if we can squeeze another question in, but for right now, this might be my last one. How has your experience in marketing helped you in your role as president or helped you with DE&I efforts? Um, you know, that's a good question. One I really thought about, I think just kind of off the cuff, I think one of the most important things is really trying to understand who your customer is, right? And that's one of the, tenants and you know kind of at the core of what marketing is to understand um, both what your offering is right for us our offering is racing that's our product and so for us to develop the most impactful racing that we can um, is what we do and part of that has to do with a, a never-ending um, journey to create the best racing that we can and, and we've it's been a long road and our, our racing right now is arguably as good as it's ever been and we're coming out with a brand new car um, next year call our next generation car next gen car that will make the racing frankly even better um, um, but i think it's really product and then customer base and understanding what the customer wants so our customer had said hey we want to use we race at all kinds of different racetracks so this the track across the street is a super speedway it's it's two and a half miles long at daytona international speedway and there's pack racing that goes there. But we have a racetrack that's a half a mile. We've got one and a half mile tracks. We have road courses. And so our fans had said, we want more road courses and we want more short tracks. So last year we had two road courses on the schedule. Um, this year we have seven. Um, and so we're responding from a schedule standpoint to what our fans want. Um, and that's important. And 
you know, we'll continue to do that. Um, and as it relates to marketing and DI, and I, I think it's really, again, understanding the business um, of our, our business as NASCAR uh, and, and the importance of um, knowing that fan base and knowing what was going to resonate with them and what wasn't. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. This has been, um, you know, something that I um, will always remember. Um, I appreciate you being here, your courage. Um, this has all been very transformative in the sense of what NASCAR, what your leadership has done. And as a Black African American woman, I can't tell you what I felt as um, someone who didn't pay that much attention to NASCAR. And then all of a sudden there, would it, there it was um, and what you were doing and in relationship to the work that I have built my career, my life around. So I just want you to know I'm so appreciative and I hope that you as as well as the organization continue on and you have now absolutely a new fan. Thank you once again and uh, other people are just thanking you as well. I am going to invite Dean Sharma back on um, who has um, to close us out and has some few words to say. Thank you again. Thank you Wanda. Well thank you Wanda. That was uh, wonderful. Uh, you know the moderation there are, uh, Steve, a lot of questions. The questions are still flowing, but unfortunately we have couldn't ask them all. Uh, some great questions. Uh, we are running out of time, but there is one question that I have to ask you that came from uh, uh, one of your fellow alums, class of 91. And he asked, since you since you grew up uh, in, in Vermont and you grew up loving racing and NASCAR, the question was, uh, who was your favorite favorite NASCAR driver growing up as a kid? Well, that's interesting. So when I first started going to, to races, there was a track that no longer exists up in Milton, Vermont called Catamount Speedway. Um, it was owned by a, a, a guy who was a legend, um, Ken Squire, who uh, was a famous broadcaster on CBS um, and just a who's from Stowe, Vermont, great, great guy. Um, so I went with my father and my brother, I was five years old, my brother, also UVM uh, alum, uh, was six. And our favorite cartoon at the time was Speed Racer. So it was a white number five. So there was a car driven by, um, by a Quebec driver. His name was Jean-Paul Cabana. And I was rooting for him, my father, who was born in Milton, Vermont, said, you are going to root for the Vermonter. So I started to root for at least outwardly for, for um, two drivers, the Dragon Brothers, um, who were there. As it relates to, um, you know, kind of more of our large tracks, I was, uh, I, was a, I was a Rusty Wallace fan. So I don't think I've ever told Rusty Wallace that, um, but because I, I don't want it to go to his head. Um, but I, um, NASCAR has been in my blood for a long time. I worked at the NFL for a long time, but it was almost a, like a, a coming home for me to go to NASCAR. Great, thank you. I, I just want to, uh, something I, I didn't mention because, uh, you know, uh, President uh, Gary Mala was supposed to introduce you and he had technical problems uh, uh, getting onto the event. But I want to mention one thing uh, related to your bio. That in your senior year, year uh, you set a school record in the 800 meters at the Dartmouth relay. And that time still remains the sixth best today. I don't know if you know that it still remains the sixth best today. And uh, well, you, you just, uh, you know, you were doing it with your feet rather than uh, uh, in, in a race car. So we are we are absolutely delighted uh, that you could join us, and this was a really inspiring for us, and you know, uh, a demonstration of true leadership. And uh, thank you for coming back again. Uh, it's it's been a couple couple of years since you came and talked to our students, but a lot has changed since then. So, yeah. it, you know, this 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 was truly inspiring, and we hope you will come back again to speak to our students once uh, the pandemic is over. Uh, I'm sure they would love to have a face-to-face -face conversation with you, which is 
I think is much richer than uh, than a uh, uh, conversation over teams. So, Steve, what uh, what what we what we normally do uh, uh, is to send you a, a memento of the talk, uh, and this will arrive in the mail. And the memento is a framed poster of your talk, and I hope uh, you know it will be something you can use and hang up uh, in your office or uh, maybe in the conference room or somewhere to remind you of this inspiring talk. So thank you again, Steve. This was wonderful. Thank, thank you, Dean Sharma, and, and my my thanks to um, President Garamala, who's, who has been, uh, he and I have developed a, a, a nice relationship uh, over the past nine months and very thoughtful and, you know, appreciate uh, his willingness to share things with me and I, and I enjoy sharing things with him as well. I wanted to make sure I said that. Great. Well, thank you. This is wonderful. Thanks again. And thank, thank you so everyone much. for joining us.